Kreutzer number one is a perfect example of why a so-called basic etude is not really so basic after all. Um, this is an etude that's very versatile and it can go from pretty easy to very difficult, almost completely dependent on the tempo because this etude, unlike a lot of other ones, is a lot tougher the slower it goes. It sounds basically like this. So, the challenges here are maintaining a smooth sound, distributing the bow, and playing dynamics that don't always agree with the bow direction, so-called reverse dynamics. In other words, crescendoing on a down bow, doing a diminuendo on an up bow. So, in order to make these dynamics work, you have to distribute the bow, and you have to use the three variables in sound production. That's bow speed, bow pressure, and sounding point. So for example, if I just wanted to maintain a slow bow with no dynamics, I'd pick a spot fairly close to the bridge because it's, it's hard to play a slow bow with a good tone further away from the bridge. So I'd pick a spot pretty near the bridge and I'd just draw the bow smoothly. So to make a crescendo, however, I have to both distribute the bow differently, I need to save a lot more bow for that second measure, and I have to change some of my variables to make the crescendo. So the first part is saving the bow in the first half. That means even a little closer to the bridge. See, with that placement, I could hold the bow basically forever. Then in the second bar, where there's a crescendo, I increase the bow speed, and because I'm near the bridge, I have to increase the bow pressure as well. You remember what happens if you try and increase the speed without the pressure. You get that ponticello sound, that glassy sound. So if I increase both speed and pressure, I get my crescendo. So, the reverse is true for the diminuendo on the up bow. I start out with that same fast speed and pressure and I gradually decrease the speed and pressure. So, as I said, this is easier when it's faster. So let's put on the metronome and see how it feels to play it with a strict pulse. The metronome helps us check our pulse but eventually we need to develop that internal pulse that we can count long notes very accurately. I'll set the metronome to 120 for the quarter note. One, two, three. So you saw that toward the end of the bars that I just played, there were bars with just, uh, there were bows with just one bar in them. For those, we can use a faster bow. That also means that because we're playing piano, we need to stay further away from the bridge. Again, if we tried to play a fast bow piano at the same sounding point that we had, so instead, So it may seem like <clears throat> a lot of variables at once, but if you go back to the lesson on sound production, you can get used to changing them one at a time. Here you must do them in combination to get the dynamics. Let's get the metronome a little bit slower. I'll set it now to 92, that's actually a good bit slower. Now the good news is that I get to make my changes more slowly. The bad news is that I have to make them more slowly and make the bow last longer.
So you see, part of my challenge there is really saving the bow in that first bar and then being willing to spend it at the very end, then keeping that same fast speed as I start the up bow. Now let's do it on 60 to the quarter note. At this point, I'm really having to save in that first bar, but if I choose a good sounding point, it's not that, not that bad. Now, if you have a smartphone, because uh, this metronome has its limits, it can only go down so slow, the tempo. So if you have a smartphone, you can put the metronome on really low numbers like 30 or even 20, and instead of playing with a quarter note pulse, which does a lot of the work for you, you can play with a half note pulse, <clears throat> even a whole note pulse if you're very bold. This way you really get that practice counting the big beats and you get to see if your internal pulse matches up with the metronome. It's such great practice for all the excerpts where you have to count long notes under pressure. You'll never have to count notes quite this long, so this, this is making it even harder for you. Now for the bow changes, you can go back to the lesson on bow changes, but remember that basically in a good bow change nothing really has to happen. As long as you keep the sound the same at the end of one bow as at the beginning of the next, it won't sound as much like a bow change. There's your smooth bow change. You don't need any trickery at the frog. One thing that will help with the frog, remember, is that you have, you feel like your arm and your hand are floating. They're all in the same level. You don't have a drooping wrist. You've picked up the bow nicely into the hand, and your arm, instead of hanging down, basically matches the level of your hand. That gives you that floating feeling at the frog. The changes of the frog much harder than the changes at the tip. Now, for the last step, although it's great to practice this without vibrato just to isolate the bow problems, you can practice it with vibrato, varying your vibrato with the dynamic. In other words, getting a little wider, perhaps a little faster, as the dynamic goes up, and listening to make sure that it's continuous. There, you build the habit that the vibrato matches the sound. This is a great etude, very versatile, basic in a way, but something that all the greats practice all the time.